beautiful out there. There are trees, there are uh, rocks, there are... It's just idyllic. It's been like a really good place to come every summer since I was maybe 16 or 17 years. A place where I like fall in love, a place where I've, we've discussed uh, the world problems and of course solved them. And a place that's uh, really amazing. Shortly before 5 p.m., Anders Brevik arrives at the lake dressed in a police uniform. He waves a fake ID at the ferryman and asks for a ride to the island. The ferryman helps him load his duffel bag full of weapons and ammo as they set out on the crossing, a little less than half a mile. Meanwhile, news of the Oslo bombing is just spreading through the camp. People were confused. They were calling around their friends. Uh, they were hugging each other. They were crying. The last thing said in these meetings was that we have to think about and remember that Utah is probably the safest and best place we can be at this moment. Somebody called their parents and they said like, oh, I'm so glad that you're on the island because then you're safe and we don't have to worry about you. Little does anyone know what horror is headed their way. It's late afternoon on Friday, July 22, 2011, and Anders Brevik, dressed as a police officer, is closing in on the island of Utoya, where young Labour Party members meet for their annual retreat. Rather than target Muslim communities, uh, he wanted to focus on the next generation of left-wing leaders, and to that end, headed to Utoya Island, where future leaders of the Labour Party were congregating. He arrives at the Eastern Dock just after 5 p.m., brandishing his assault rifle and kills his first victim 30 seconds later. He then makes his way up the main path towards the cafeteria, where most of the students are gathered after hearing news of the Oslo bombing. He was in a police uniform, so I first saw him in a uniform just walking very calmly, and I thought, well, this must be good, but he was like, heavy armed. So I was thinking that that was, that was weird, but at least he was a policeman. He very deliberately camouflages himself wearing a policeman's uniform. So quite clearly, it was a device wearing the uniform so as to reassure those people whose lives he was going to take. Brevik beckons a group of young people over to him and then opens fire. I heard screams. And I saw people running. And I saw people falling as they were running because they were shot in the back. He went over to one of the people who was on the ground, who had fallen to the ground, and he shot him in the head. And then he went over to one of the others and shot him in the head as well. Uh, people were coming up to our camp, just running as fast as they could and screaming and saying, yeah, people are shot and people are, and it's a, it's a guy with a gun and just run and keep your heads down. And at the point, I was like, OK, this is just somebody's joking. But the scene is terrifyingly real, and Brevik is just getting started. He walks through the campsite in the middle of the island, looking for victims and shooting them one by one. People panic and run for cover in the tented area. Adrian is among them. People ran uh, through the, the tent city. And halfway into the tent city, I stopped, turned around, uh, hid behind a, a large tent, and just to see what was happening. He looked like a main character from a Nazi movie. He had his hair backwards. It was blonde hair backwards. He had that special f look on his face, the, 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 like a rock. So we walked off to the tents, opened them slowly. We looked inside, shot, and you can see the tent turning red from inside. He was extremely calm. He was walking straight towards people, shot them. Walked in another direction, shot another person. Looked around, saw who else to shoot, shot him. He was calm. The bomb being left outside the government building has a distance psychologically between the deaths of those people who will die as a result of the bomb exploding and Brevik. 
But when Brevik is shooting people on that island, he is looking into their faces. Terrified campers begin scattering to the edges of the island, searching desperately for a hiding place. People ran uh, through the, the tent city. People were just uh, laying all over on top of each other to just try to hide and just try to uh, be like invisible from, from the path where the killer was walking. But uh, there was like too many people. Some of the campers, like Vegard, barricade themselves inside the few buildings on the island. I ran through like a short wood, woody area and then I came to this cabin where uh, I hid with around 40 others. I hid in, a, in one of the bedrooms under, under the bed and uh, there I just hid and prayed. Outside, Breva continues to stalk his prey, searching and shooting. He simply became a hunter. He simply became a one-man army, a soldier who had to do what he had to do. He would have been feeling so powerful, as if his mission was to exterminate, as he would see, to kill as many young people as he possibly could. That's when I started texting home. You know, those, the last text message kind of thing. Thanks for everything. Love you all. Many people try to take cover in the woods, while Nicolene's group heads toward the western shoreline and crouches on a small shelf hidden under a cliff. The shelf was like a um, couple of meters down from the path, and uh, we heard uh, somebody change... Uh, change the magazine or refill the bullets on the gun. And we just, uh, we just heard like our hearts were like really, beat from heart was like really loud and everyone just tried to not breathe and not say words. Breve continues crisscrossing the island while dozens of campers like Adrian desperately try to stay one step ahead of him. It was a bloody massacre. He uh, was so calm, so relaxed, so, so controlled. Uh, you could tell that he had planned this for a long time. At 527, police are first alerted to the gunfire on Utoya, but their arrival will be painfully slow. Brevik will have full run of the island for another terrifying hour. Thirty minutes into his shooting spree, Anders Brevik has turned an idyllic summer camp into the scene of a bloody massacre, and his rampage isn't nearly over. He has picked the perfect location for his shooting spree. It's almost half a mile from shore, and police, distracted by Brevik's massive bombing in downtown Oslo, are an hour away. Dozens of terrified campers are still scrambling for survival, searching for new hiding places as the killer's hollow point bullets ring out across the island. This was much worse than you see in a movie. But everybody was focused that when you are on the run on the island, you need to go down to the water, jump into the water. And so we did. Long before police arrive, a news helicopter is dispatched to the island to investigate reports of gunfire. We started looking around in the water and of course we could see a lot of people swimming in all directions and then we could see the boats and then you kind of start looking at things differently and you start to, to noticing uh, that something is terribly wrong down there. But the lake is icy cold and it's an exhausting swim to safety, especially for injured victims or those weighed down by their clothes. Realizing he's not going to survive the crossing, Adrian turns back for the island. It appears that Brevik then walks along the shore towards the dock. It's here the news camera films him standing over several bodies in the shallow water. Some people try to swim for safety, but Adrian stays put. He pointed the, the machine gun at me. He pointed it directly at me. I could see straight in, and I could see the fearless look he had, the, the murderistic look, the... 
the look that told you that you are about to die. So I yelled uh, as loud as I can and I begged him, please don't shoot me. Uh, please no, don't do it. And somehow he didn't. He turned around towards the people that still were swimming, shot a couple rounds at them and yelled, this is the, this is the day you're going to die. I'm going to kill you all. Adrian is one of the blurry figures in this freeze frame, watching as another friend begs for his life. I could hear his boot approaching. Two meters, one meter, he was above me. I could hear him reload. And then I knew it, it was now over. Brevik shoots Adrian in the shoulder. Nearly 6 p.m., an hour into the rampage, Adrian plays dead, hiding under the corpses of his fallen friends. Back in Oslo, emergency personnel are dealing with the country's worst domestic attack since World War II. Brevik's multiple attacks are stretching the capital's security and emergency services to their limit. Brevik carries on his massacre with an eerie and menacing sense of calm. One has to look at the, the deadly effectiveness of everything that he did. There's no evidence at all that he lost control, that his mental state had deteriorated or anything like that. This was a man that remained totally in control. It may be that as time went on, there's some suggestion that he was deriving satisfaction, the allegations that he cheered when he was actually uh, killing people. But in general, that was not to an extent that he was losing control of himself. Everything was running like clockwork. Everything was going to plan. And with police stuck back on shore with engine trouble, Anders Brevik will own this island for another horrifying 30 minutes. At 6.25 p.m., after a killing spree that lasted a horrifying 90 minutes on the rustic Norwegian island of Vutoya, two squads of counterterrorism police arrive from Oslo. For victims who've been terrorized by a gunman in a police uniform, this isn't a welcome sight. I heard screams like never before. I was looking up and I saw three policemen coming with, uh, with machine guns. And remember that this man, this terrorist, was also a policeman. And now we were thinking, oh my God, now the rest are coming. They're coming to kill us. So we threw rocks, we, we cried, we screamed. Uh, but we all realized very fast that when they started to help us uh, with our wounds, that these were real policemen and that they were there to help us. I heard people outside that were screaming, yelling commands at each other, you know, go, go, and stuff like this. I, I don't remember exactly what they said, but something to that effect, and that, that was very reassuring, and I could just wait for them to just, you know, break in. And that was just a moment of extreme relief. Uh, and even more so when they came into the room that I was in, and, and they finally, you know, accepted that there was only two civilians there to come out in the, the living room and just seeing, you know, 35 of your comrades, none were dead. It only takes police a few minutes to find Brevik. After that, we came over in more skogsterreng, and brought for him, so stood the with his hands heavy and over the head. His cooperative surrender doesn't fit the pattern of a terrorist or a spree killer. Men like Thomas Hamilton, who in 1996 shot dead 16 Scottish schoolchildren and their teacher in Dunblane, and then killed himself. Or Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, who carried out the Columbine High School massacres in 1999. They also turned their guns on themselves. 
Of course, what's interesting 